Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue talking about deformation and metamorphic rocks. So in this video we're going to be thinking about what are folds and how are they shaped and this is going to correspond to section 8.5 of your textbook. So the first thing to remember about folds is that they represent ductile deformation. So when we have a sequence of rocks, and this sequence of rocks is uh, exposed to a compressive stress, so the rocks are being squished, a couple of things can happen. In the brittle zone, of course, we know that our rocks can fail through cracking, and with that, you know, that will lead to the formation of joints and faults. However, once we're below about 10 to 15 kilometers in the Earth's crust, we have, of course, transitioned into the ductile zone. Now, down in the ductile zone, this same sequence of rocks, because it is more plastic and able to flow, will not fail in a brittle fashion. Instead, our sequence of rocks will buckle and fold in response to the compression. Now, by allowing our rocks to fold, we are accommodating the compressive stress. So if we look at this block of rock right here, you can see that we have a couple of layers. We've got this orange layer here and this brown layer here, and you can see they've folded, they've buckled. And the reason they've buckled is that they are being compressed, well, this layer of rock is being compressed from the side. Now, this compression and this buckling is essentially a way of accommodating the, the shortening of the rock, which is caused by the compression. So if you imagine that the rock wasn't actually folded, the width of this block of rock would actually be larger. But because our block of rock is being compressed, the rock has to somehow accommodate that compressive force. And because our rock is going to behave in a ductile fashion, the way it will accommodate that compressive force is simply by allowing our layer of rock to buckle. And this buckling allows this block of rock to become shorter, and as such it has accommodated the compressive forces. Now the thing you'll notice about the folds is that the folds themselves are orientated on this diagram north-south. However, the compressive force that we see is actually coming in east-west. So the first thing you need to remember is that folds will typically form at 90 degrees to the direction in which the rock is being compressed. Okay, so here we can see we have ourselves a sequence of rocks and we can actually see two different types of folds. We have one fold over here, so we have a situation where we have an arch shape. We can see if we track this brown layer of rock right here, our brown layer of rock comes up and then it comes down. So this is going to be defined as an anticline. Now in an anticline we, uh, we look and see where the oldest and youngest rocks are located. So if you imagine this sequence of rocks was not folded, the principle of superposition would say that this layer of rock down here would be the oldest and these layers of rock up here would be the youngest. So in the case of an anticline, when we look at the age of the rocks, what we see is the oldest rocks are located in the core of the anticline and the youngest rocks are located on the outer edge of the anticline. Now, the other type of fold that we have is a type of fold that we refer to as a syncline. In the case of a syncline, you can see that it's not an arch. Instead, it's a trough. So our fold is coming down like so. So in the case of the anticline, the fold is pointing up. In the case of the syncline, the fold is pointing down. Now, in terms of the age of the rocks in a syncline, we have the reverse situation. So the rocks which are in the core of our syncline, this area here, are going to be the youngest rocks. The rocks which are on the outer edge of our syncline, on the other hand, are going to be the oldest rocks. So you can see that by using both the shape of the fold and by being able to work out which rocks are the oldest and the youngest, we can quickly identify what type of fold are we looking at. Are we looking at an anticline or are we looking at a syncline? So in this picture here, you can see that we have a sequence of rocks which has been folded. And I've already given away what type of fold it is, but let's see if we can actually spot our anticline. So we can see on this side that our rocks clearly have dips, so they're dipping off towards the right-hand side of the image. And we can see on the other side of our, our structure here that we can see these rocks are dipping off towards the left-hand side of our image. So it's clear that our sequence of rocks is coming up and then coming down the other side. And so they're doing something like this. We have a sequence of rocks that are coming up 
and coming down. And so we have this arch shape. So instantly we know that what we're looking at is an anticline. Now, because it's an anticline, therefore we instantly know that when trying to date our rocks, the oldest rocks are going to be down here in the core of the anticline, and the youngest rocks are going to be over here towards the outer edge of our anticline. So in this situation, you can see that we have a slightly different structure. We have a syncline. And you can pick out the syncline simply by following this layer of rock right here. So there you go. So you can see we have the trough shape, and there it is. So we instantly know this is going to be a syncline. Now, once again, in terms of the age of the rocks that we're looking at, we know that the rocks in the core of our syncline right here are going to be the youngest rocks. Whereas we know the rocks towards the edge of our syncline down here are going to be the oldest rocks. So, as you can quite clearly see, folding of rocks is, on the whole, relatively straightforward, and it's relatively straightforward to identify the two main types of folds, anticlines and synclines. So the next features we're going to think about are domes and basins. So when we look at this diagram on the top here, we are looking at a dome. So let's look at this side of our diagram. So the first thing you can see is if we track this grey layer of rock here, we can see it comes up, so it's moving upwards, and then on the other side, it comes back down. So instantly you are thinking, right, we clearly have ourselves an anticline, and that would be a good first guess. However, when we look at this diagram, we can see that in the core of our fold right here, we have this gray area of rock that has these plus signs in it, these crosses. So this is a common symbol that denotes igneous rocks. So it could be anything like a granite or a gabbro, for instance. So what we have here is we have a intrusion of magma which has entered the crust and we know our magma is going to be buoyant, it's going to want to rise and so it's naturally going to cause the crust above it to dome up. Now because it's causing the crust above it to dome up, what's going to happen is it's going to cause the crust to dip away in all directions. So if we think about what we're looking at here, we can see that because the crust is being pushed up, we're going to have these rocks on the, uh, on the eastern side, so the western side, will be dipping off towards the west. These rocks on the eastern side will be dipping off towards the east. On the northern side of our structure, these rocks will be dipping off towards the north. And on the southern side of our structure, the rocks will be dipping off to the south. So you can see how a dome is a essentially a shape that has uh, the rocks dipping away along all sides of the structure. Now let's just go back to the previous slide and compare that to our fold. So here's our fold and you'll notice that the, the rocks on this side of our fold are dipping down. The rocks on this side of our fold are dipping down. But the fold itself is this elongate structure as you can see. So when we actually look at you know, the, the way the rocks are dipping with our fold, you will see that it's slightly different when you compare it to our dome. So the fact that our dome has rocks dipping in all directions along its margins, and the dome itself is an approximately circular to elliptical shape, shows us that it's an area of crust that has been folded, but it's not been folded in the same way as the folds, the anticlines and synclines that we were just talking about. So in the case of the anticlines and synclines, we know that the folding is the result of a compressional force, the rock is being squished. In the case of the formation of a dome, what we have is a situation where we have an intrusion which is actively pushing up the crust from below. So this is a slightly different mechanism for forming an area of a raised crust, or at least an area where we fold the crust, in this case in response to the presence of an intrusion. So on the bottom of our slide, we now have a diagram representing a basin. So a basin is once again different to a fold. So we've already discussed how folds have this long linear shape. In contrast, a basin is going to be circular or elliptical in its form. So we can see that our basin looks a lot like a syncline. We obviously have a trough shape depression which is formed due to the rock flexing. And just like a syncline, the youngest rocks will be in the middle and the oldest rocks will be on the outside. Now, in the case of a syncline, the rocks along the edge of our syncline will always dip, uh, sorry, the rocks along the edge of our basin, sorry, will always dip towards the center of our basin. Now, the formation of basins is a little bit more complicated than domes. Domes are relatively easy to explain, the vast majority of them are due to intrusions. 
In the case of basins, it's normally due to what we refer to as crustal downwarping. And this downwarping, this flexure of the Earth's crust can result from several processes. So it can result to, from deep processes occurring in the Earth's crust or maybe even the Earth's upper mantle, causing the crust to flex downwards in response to some kind of force. But nevertheless, this flexure of the crust, this warping of the crust downwards, ends up producing this basin that has this approximately circular to elliptical form, and it causes the rocks along the margins of our basin to dip towards the centre, as opposed to our dome where the rocks will dip away from the centre. So another type of fold that we may come across are monoclines. So monoclines, as the name suggests, is essentially a structure which only has one layer which is dipping. So if you think of a fold, folds have two sides. One side is dipping one way, one side is dipping the other way. In the case of a monocline we can see that we have a horizontal sequence of rocks up here, then we have our partial fold here, and then our rocks become horizontal again here. So essentially we have a structure that only has one limb, and so this is why it's referred to as a monocline. So we can see a monocline here, so we can track our horizontal rocks coming across, then they dip down, and then they become horizontal over here. So monoclines tend to form in response to some kind of structure, normally a thrust or a reverse fault, which is situated down here, which is pushing up this block of rock relative to this block over here. But instead of the rock breaking in a brittle fashion, it flexes in a ductile fashion instead. So as this block of rock over here gets pushed up, it causes the rock above it to flex and fold, producing a monocline, rather than a, uh, a standard anticline or syncline, which is, of course has two limbs which are dipping. The monocline which, which is produced only has a single dipping limb. So now let's think about the geometry of folds. So as you can see here, we have a simplified diagram of an anticline. Now there's a couple of terms here which are very commonly used by geologists when describing folds. The first term that we can see is hinge. So the hinge is the region of our layer of rock which has undergone the highest degree of deformation because this is the area of our layer which is actually flexing to allow the folds to form. So you can see that either side of our hinge, we actually have sequences which are relatively planar, they're relatively flat. So these are the limbs of the fold. So the entire sequence here has been deformed. However, the vast majority of the deformation has been focused in the hinge region right here, because that's where most of the folding has taken place. The limbs, on the other hand, remain relatively undeformed and planar. Now, when we think about folds, we tend to think about folds as horizontal structures, so they're perfectly level with the ground surface. However, that's not always the case. It's relatively common for our folds to have plunge. So the fold itself will dip in one direction. It could dip to the north, it could dip to the east, the south, the west, the northeast, the southwest, etc. So we can see in this diagram, we have a fold. We can see there's one layer of rock in our fold and here's another layer of rock. So once again we have ourselves an anticline. Now in this particular instance though our fold is not horizontal. If the fold was horizontal the same amount of the fold would be above the ground surface all the way along but that's not the case. In this instance you can see that this portion of the fold is far more exposed than this portion of the fold over here so clearly our fold is tilted. It has plunge. So our fold is plunging off towards the left-hand side of the block. So the plunge is coming down like so. Now, because our fold has plunge, what that's going to mean is we're going to end up with this exposed rock above the ground surface. And so we're actually going to slowly over time have this exposed area eroded away. And so when geologists look at the fold on the surface of the Earth, so when we put it on a geologic map, what we'll see is we'll see a sequence of rocks which steadily get closer and closer and closer together and then meet and then come away on the other side. So it's going to produce a V-like shape on the surface of the Earth. So don't always assume that rocks, you know, and for sure say, don't always assume that folds are going to be perfectly horizontal structures. A lot of the time they will have some plunge, so they themselves will have some dip, and that will affect how we see the fold on the surface of the Earth. Now, when we're discussing folds, the most easy type of fold to identify is what's referred to as an upright fold. So in the case of an upright fold, the fold is, as the name suggests, upright. 
Now, this goes for both synclines and anticlines. So if you just imagine you took this image and you flipped it 180 degrees, it would still be considered an upright syncline. Now, we can see that in this diagram, we have what's referred to as the axial surface um, marked on. So uh, before we discuss actual surface, we're actual surface, we're going to discuss one other term, which is the fold axis. So the fold axis runs along the fold like so. So it runs along the hinge of our fold. And the fold axis is essentially a line. And the fold axis says, right, this is where the fold hinge is located, and this is the orientation of the fold hinge. And it can also tell us, is that fold hinge dipping? You know, is it horizontal or does it have some kind of dip like 20 degrees, 40 degrees, 80 degrees? Who knows? Now, in the case of the axial plane, you will see that it is a 2D surface rather than a line. So the axial plane essentially shows us what the orientation of the fold axis is. So if we look at this diagram here, we can see that our axial surface is vertical. So this tells us that our fold must therefore be upright. And you'll see why in the next couple of diagrams where I'm going to show you examples of folds where the axial surface has been tilted. Now, another thing to note about this particular fold is that it is what we refer to as a symmetrical fold. That means either side of the fold is a mirror of the other side. So if we look at this layer of rock here that's been folded, we will see that number one, the dip, so the angle of this limb here, is the same as this limb here. You will also notice that the length of this limb here is also the same as the length of this limb here. So the fact that each side of the fold is a mirror of the other tells us that this is a symmetrical fold. Now, what we're looking at here is an asymmetrical fold. So let's once again follow this brown layer of rock right here. So what we can see is that this limb of our fold is relatively long but relatively low angle whereas this limb of our fold has a lot higher of an angle it's a lot steeper but it's comparatively shorter so you can see that the limbs of our folds are not mirror uh, limbs of our fold are not mirror images of each other so therefore we know instantly we are looking at an asymmetrical fold now if i was to look at the fold axis, so if you remember the fold axis just simply tells me where is the hinge located, I would draw a line that comes along the hinge like so. However, this fold axis is not actually telling me about how the fold is orientated, because we can see that this fold has some tilt to it, doesn't it? It's not a nice uh, upright even fold. In this case, we can see our layers of rock have a, a different structure to them. So when we draw our axial plane through our fold, what we can see is that it has dip, it's tilted. And so this is showing us that our fold has moved away from being an upright fold, and instead we have a fold that's beginning to be deformed, it's becoming an asymmetrical fold. So here we go, We're using these yellow lines we can see the position of these limbs. One limb is long and low angle, the other limb is shorter and steeper. And so because we don't have these mirroring limbs, it tells us that our fold must therefore be asymmetrical. So the third type of fold that we're looking at is an overturned fold. And when we look at this fold, the first thing you're going to think is, right, that's another asymmetrical fold, isn't it? Because we can see that one limb of our fold is long and low angle, and the other limb of our fold is short and steep. Therefore, the limbs are not mirror images of each other. So at a superficial level, you would say, right, that's clearly an asymmetrical fold. But it's not because there's something slightly different going on in this case that we need to define. Now, before we do that, let's just talk about the fold axis once again. So if I was to draw my fold axis on this diagram, it would simply run along the hinge of my fold like so. Remember, the fold axis is a line. So by now, what you will have noticed is that the fold axis would be a line like so on this diagram. It would be a line like so on this diagram, and it would be a line like so on this diagram. So in fact, the fold axes for each of these folds would look exactly the same, because remember, it's just the line. It doesn't really have any two or three dimensional shape to it. So all that would happen is this fold axis would simply be able to give me an idea about the orientation of my fold. Now, when we look at the fold's uh, axial surface, what can we see? Well, we can see that in this case, the axial surface has become even more tilted versus our asymmetrical fold.
so we can see that our asymmetrical fold here has quite a steeply dipping axial surface but in this case you can see that the tilt has become the dip has become even more extreme and once again we're going to be able to mark out the presence of our axial surface by simply tracking the position of the hinge as we move through our fold so as we can see we've got the brown layer here so this would be the position of our hinge for the brown layer and this would be the position of the hinge for the gray layer and so we can simply draw a line connecting the two and we can instantly begin to see the location of our axial surface. Now the next thing we need to think about is why is this fold being classified as an overturned fold versus an asymmetrical fold and it's all to do with these limbs down here. So the thing you'll notice is that this limb has actually gone past 90 degrees. It's been tilted so far that it's gone past the vertical. So if you think of the, you know, 90 degrees, it's going to be a straight line like so. So we can see that this line, this limb has gone past 90 degrees. So when we have a fold like this, where one limb is at 90 degrees or has gone past 90 degrees, it becomes a very specific type of fold, which we refer to as an overturned fold. And overturned folds tend to be associated with areas where we have lots and lots of tectonic deformation. Because when you think about it, it's going to take quite a lot of effort to actually cause a fold to fall towards its side, isn't it? So when we look at our folds here, we can see that we actually have a progression. So if we look, most folds are going to start off as upright folds. But over time, as our sequence of rocks gets more and more deformed, what's going to happen is our folds are steadily going to get pushed sideways. And so over time, our upright fold can be deformed to give us an asymmetrical fold. And then as the deformation continues to get even more advanced, the asymmetrical fold can eventually morph into an overturned fold. Alright, thank you for watching everybody and have a good day.